back again. Yeah, with an, uh, another hot take. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a couple uh, weeks. We, yeah, it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, anything good last couple of weeks? Oh, not really. Um, late, been having a couple late nights lately working on uh, Stripe SDA upgrades, um, which are all, uh, I believe, functional in pay now in a branch. Um, you know, we talked briefly, what, yesterday about some of their, uh, the Stripe Ruby mock, um, you know, lagging upgrades or whatever that, that are quite a ways behind on some of the new changes, but makes sense uh, when you're you're building a mocking library for an API for some other business that's not your business that uh, you're going to have to re-implement kind of a very light version of their business just to make that work and not an easy thing to maintain. So um, it's been taking a little while to get all the tests and stuff back up to speed. But uh, yeah, I think pay is pretty much ready to go. Um, there's a little bit of the status changes that I need to work on that maybe uh, don't work perfect yet because I'm still trying to keep Braintree in sync with the uh, the SCA changes in Stripe um, and their introduction of statuses kind of adds a bit more complexity because um, I'm going to try and, I guess, apply the same kind of statuses to the brain tree code as well. Uh, but it's not always going to be up to date or in sync because of, you know, they don't have quite the same web hooks and stuff either. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. It's kind of, it's kind of, you know, not turning out to be the greatest, uh, balance anymore because of those issues and brain tree doesn't even brain has got to email us to opt in to SEA, which sounds ridiculous to me. Um, so I don't really understand what's going on over there. Uh, but yeah, I've been having fun with that. And it's nice to I think I finally have my head wrapped around it. It took a while and I kept just working on Stripe stuff for, I don't know, half an hour here, half an hour there. And it takes more time than that and focus to uh, actually get in and get your understanding of it all. Um, so yeah, I've enjoyed the the painful process that you went through a few months nope. back <laughs> there is no enjoyment <laughs> it's so. it's frustrating because by the time you understand it you're done with it and then you're like i could have done this so much differently but you're done with it so it's <laughs> yeah. like eh. um one of the funny things was like we originally uh took laravel cashier as our kind of inspiration and like ported that over to ruby because they did a really good job with that. So I took that same approach and it uh, worked out really well. Um, there was just some things with like, how's the JavaScript changes supposed to work? Because this is mostly just a backend uh, library. That was kind of interesting to wrap your head around. Like there's now to collect a credit card, there's instead of just tokenizing a credit card number, you have two different paths you can go down instead a payment intent for you're going to charge the card as part of this process and then there's the setup intent which even if you're going to charge like a subscription as part of your process like right away uh you are supposed to use a setup intent um and that seemed kind of strange to me like some of those things weren't very clear and it took me quite some time to be like I, it turns out maybe I don't need payment intents at all, even though that's kind of what all the documentation says I need or whatever. And I was like, oh, weird. You know, cashier drop support for Braintree, right? I did see that. And, you know, I've thought about doing that as well. But honestly, like, I'm mainly just using Braintree for PayPal support. So I don't have to integrate that directly. Mm -hmm. And like PayPal doesn't even let, like you just get a PayPal account and with Braintree as the processor, like you don't even know what they're paying with a bank account, uh, their PayPal balance, a credit card. It doesn't matter. So like our integration, mm -hmm. as long as you're just using Stripe uh, or a, uh, 
PayPal, I mean, doesn't really matter. So for the most part, none of that has to change at all, which is kind of nice. Um, if you're using it for credit cards and other things, and maybe it does, but uh, I don't, I haven't emailed them to turn it on yet. Um, it's recorded. <laughs> like, why do I, why can't I click a button and enable SCA? Or why isn't it enabled by default? I don't understand. So it will probably still exist because I'm using it. Um, but it's probably not going to be like functional for SCA. Not for a while. So if anyone wants to contribute that, go right ahead. But uh, I don't think I'm going to be making that a priority for quite a while. Mm. I saw you selected a new Hatchbox logo. Yeah, I ran a 99 Designs for that. And man, I almost got a logo submitted for every dollar I spent, which is insane. That's so cool. like if you create a contest on there, people submit designs and then you can set one of the options for your contest. Like it's a guaranteed contest, which means you guarantee that someone receives that money because they actually have like money back versions where you didn't like the logo. So you just don't have to pay anyone. So then you get a lot more submissions when you're like, look, someone's taking home the money, you know, I'm picking one. So yeah, I got like 600 some logos submitted and it took forever to like go through those. So that yeah. is step number one of, uh, you know, many things for redesigning the site and trying to clean it up. It's cool. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're giving Hatchbox a little love. Yeah. It's been getting, you know, not, not design love, but like maintenance sure. and all that stuff. Like that's been a thing I've been working on forever. Um, yeah, nonstop. Yeah. But you know, like the design is like, well, the the big problem was this site was originally designed for like a single server and deploying apps to that. And then clusters made everything a lot more complicated. And as part of that, I kind of use the same layout for uh, all the pages. And so you don't, always know what you're looking at, whether it's a cluster or a server or an app and they all kind of look the same. So one of the big improvements we're going to be doing as part of this is like just changing that so that they look different, probably introducing like a sidebar and stuff. Um, and we've introduced teams so you can share clusters with people in your team and all of that, which we've kind of had in the past with collaborators, but Teams will just make it so everyone is part of the team will have access by default, where in the past you had to I invite people individually to each cluster. So mm, it's getting better. Like a real cluster. Yeah, it's <laughs> it is getting, you know, much more to where it should have been in the first place. And this is like I know Taylor Otwell had talked about this before uh as well. That like if you ever need to share anything in your app with other people. Like you should just build it with teams out of the box. And that's like one of the things jumpstart pro does is like we have teams. And so you can just use them from day one and you have a personal team for every user. So that's a team where in theory, they don't share it, any of their, those resources with other people. And stuff, and it just makes life a whole lot easier. And I wish that I had done that with, I don't know, like Go Rails and Hatchbox, and pretty much every app probably needs that just foundation, just for the option of adding that in the future. Even if you're not going to at the beginning, just makes things a whole lot easier. That's what most of my side projects do. Is like I set up those kind of relationships, but they're like then I just has won them. So there is no like uh -huh. team has many users right now, but that way I need to turn it on. I can. So yeah, or I'll do that with a has many, but just make a helper method. Like current team is uh, user dot teams dot first or something, and uh, yeah. that works out pretty well too. You know, and and you just have the option going forward. Um. I also hired a guy uh, from the GoRails community to start working with me part-time on Hatchbox. So we've been making a lot of improvements, um, which is exciting. So 
We are that's cool. I forget what we added recently, um, which was all in what's new on the site in the announcement section. But like, we're now working on trying to make it so you can just create databases in the in the app, um, similar to how Heroku does it, where you can have you know an app that's connected to four databases if you wanted to, or a database that's shared across two apps. Um, so we're going to be working on that and then integrating I, I Amazon and DigitalOcean's managed databases, uh, That's which cool. will be cool. But That'd be really cool. It, it's cool, except for the um, the Ruby gem for DigitalOcean doesn't have support for any of that. Their API has endpoints for the managed databases, which are like most of the features you can use in the web interface. Um, you can use in the API, but not all of them. And then the droplet kit gem has no support for any of it. So we've like hacked in our version of it for now. Um, and we emailed them or tweeted at them. And we're like, uh, you guys going to add this or what? And they're like, we're, we'll have a meeting about it this week or whatever. <laughs> so we'll see what happens on that. Um, and then the, of course, Amazon RDS and elastic cash we want to do for, Postgres and MySQL and Redis and uh, Memcached at some point. Um, and those are their own bundle of joy because as AWS is just extra complicated. So you're going to make sure that, you know, your VPCs and subnets are connected properly. So your EC2 instances can connect to that and so on. And, so we have a little bit more to do, which is, you know, just another piece of the app just design wise gets more and more complex. And so we've got to, you know, you can't just create a database because we have to know, well, like, do you want it on DigitalOcean or AWS or Linode or whatever? And then, um, you know, if it's EC2, it's like, or AWS, like which subnet do you want to then or VPC? And it's just a lot of complexity and each one of these services is kind of unique and it just makes it kind of slow and painful to build. And then your, your client side forms have to be pretty complicated, which is a good use case for using like view or something um, or stimulus. But yeah, um, we're kind of in the middle of that so hopefully we'll have something working in the next few weeks but we're also going to change a bit of how the workflow works as well so like when you create your app we're currently just creating a database and a redis database gets assigned like automatically and i think we're gonna make that not um not automatic and then we'll we'll make it so like heroku does where you create your app and then you have to add the Postgres or Redis add-ons. And so we'll end up making this a little bit more steps, but more flexible as well at the same time. So as long as we make it, so you create your app and have some quick links to add a new Postgres database to your cluster or whatever and assign it to that app um, as an environment variable or something that should be good. So we shall see. It'll probably take a little bit longer than I hope to get all that working. It's just, uh, again, another like fairly big refactoring of things. But um, with two hands, it's going to be a lot easier to build it and test everything and just, I don't know, wrap your head around all the weird, you know, methods and stuff that are auto-generated in the AWS gem. That one's always strange to me. Um, how that works. I don't know if you've integrated with AWS uh, too much, but they're like libraries auto generated. And so they're, it's not always consistent either. It's really weird. Huh? I haven't worked with AWS library in a hot minute. <clears throat> it's probably been two years. So. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. So <laughs> I like... you just got through your SCA integration. So you don't want to start another thing like that right away. Yeah, I really want to learn AWS, <laughs> and I feel like every day that I don't, there's like 30 more services that get added. Like, I don't know the last time you've opened an AWS menu, but it takes up the entire browser window. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, of just services. 
<laughs> yeah, and then there's like you know multiple things in each one too. Like we were looking at RDS alone, and it's like six different databases that you can create with it. Like you have Aurora, MySQL, Aurora, Postgres. You have actual Postgres and actual MySQL and whatever else. It's just uh, it's just a ton of stuff, which is you know good for them, but it's not. They they would probably be able to attract. They're they're just going for enterprise first, and then not worrying about consumers and like digital oceans going the opposite direction of kind of consumers and commoditizing things, and then going up the ladder to enterprise. And that's I think why digital oceans taking off so well. Like AWS is designed for the most complicated setups you could ever want. Um, But they don't understand at that point how to make it simple because it supports literally anything. So yeah, it's a, I don't know. I don't necessarily know. It's something that, that like everybody thinks they need to learn it, but I don't know that it's a great use of time because over time, either someone else will learn it. So you don't have to, or like, Someone's going to abstract it, so you don't have to either. It'll be. I live for the abstract. I just yeah. wait for everyone to abstract everything for me. Is that why you use Ruby instead of Assembly? <laughs> that's why. I, that's why I use Rails. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. It allows you to do a lot of things faster than than otherwise without abstraction. So, yeah, I think it's good. What have you been up to? Not a ton. I saw somebody the other day that I don't know how to answer that question anymore. Because, like, (laughs) there are lots of, like, new things in my life, but they're pretty much always the same. Um, I have two side projects. One one is the, like, church benevolent software I've been working on for a long time. And, like, we have some people using it, but it's really, like, slow to get people to use it. Um, in the last couple of weeks, like, so I have like a co-founder, if you will, and he mostly handles that. Uh, but it's been kind of quiet. And then I have another project that's similar with another co-founder. And so like in the lull, I've been looking at like right now, like help for one of those sites. is just like an HTML page with Jekyll and help for the other site doesn't exist. And so I've been looking around at like knowledge bases and stuff. And like most of them are knowledge bases and chat and tickets. And I don't need all that. I just need like a WordPress site essentially of like, just put in categories and topics. So I figured why not just build it. So I've been working on that last couple of weeks. That's been fun. So are you going to build it like an admin for editing that stuff or use something off the shelf? Yeah. So it'll be like a standalone thing. I don't know that like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. Um, I mostly am just building it for myself because I have two products that need it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I might just open it up or like throw a small price on it and let people use it. Cool. I'm excited. When when do you think you'll have something functional? Uh, I'm almost done with it. So hopefully like by the end of this weekend, early next week. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's basic. It's like, because that's all I want. I just want basic. I don't want bells and whistles. So Yeah. Rails generates scaffold knowledge base. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about making it a Rails engine and I started on it. And I was like, nah. <laughs> um, that's something that I've been talking to a couple people about for like Jumpstart Pro, um, was building a bunch of generators like scaffolds, but they do other things, you know, so you could have, oh, I don't know, a generate a model, but like comments are built in and it generates, you know, a comments controller as well. And like nested routes for that and stuff, uh, maybe like a polymorphic comments model and all that. I think that would be really interesting. We're like, we put in some basic things like into Jumpstart Pro, like uh, you, anytime you scaffold something, like 
it's paginated by default with the page e gem. It's pretty like when you're like, wow, why don't I have this? Or like, why doesn't that come with pagey where I could just, you know, build a different scaffold? It's kind of awesome. So um, it's making me think like we need more scaffolds like that just to build kind of some basic features or something like, why isn't there some basic search like using PG search or something built into your scaffolds as well, or you could just turn it on or off. That would be cool. Um, so kind of want to experiment with that idea and see where that goes. Um, but we'll see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you do the recent upgrade to Ruby two, six, five? Hell if I know, hold on. I'm telling <laughs> you. If uh, not, I'm going to go hack your machine. Uh, whoops. <laughs> ASDF. <laughs> Yeah, there's e 2.65 <laughs> yeah there was uh got it now <laughs> i think like four vulnerabilities recently like one was in webrick one was in shell um what else was here file uh related one and a denial of service in webrick as well so they cut new releases for Ruby two six two six two five and two four, and something happened to the two four one where it got messed up and you couldn't compile it, which was interesting. I went to compile it for Hatchbox users and the, it like wouldn't compile, and I was like, "That's weird." So I went to the Ruby website and it was like, "Oh, Ruby two point four point nine was released as well, and it fixes that." And I was like, "Oh, okay, so it's not something strange." Uh, like they made a mistake or something. So yeah, uh, that was interesting. I don't I really know what happened. I can't install 265 with ASDF. Oh really? Well, you should you probably have to run ASDF plugin update. Uh I, don't know, I didn't run plugin update, I ran ASD update, that's why. Yeah, cuz you have to update the plugins cuz they're not part of the core manager. Yeah. It's a little I always, annoying. I always get the commands confused. So, yeah, me too. Because it's slightly different than RBN for whatever. So, but yeah, it's I great do. because it does my Node.js. It does Elixir, like mm-hmm. yeah, Crystal, PHP, whatever. Like it's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's really like uh, that's what I've looked into in the past for a future version of Hatchbox. Maybe um, using ASDF. Uh, I've been waiting for it to be more stable because they're core has been changing and then like I had to fix the ASDF Ruby one time and uh, some of the plugins just don't keep up to date quite as fast as core changes. So I've been hesitant on that, but I think it would be an awesome um, change just so that you could specify like I want Ruby, I want PHP, I want node, I want Ruby and node and these specific versions so that that would be pretty cool, and that's kind of what you end up doing on Heroku with build packs and stuff. So maybe it's something we'll get to in the future uh, if it standardizes a bit. But at the time when I looked in it into it, it was kind of like, well, good luck if you want to do this. You're going to have to maintain it yourself and become a contributor to ASDF pretty actively. And I was like, ah, I don't know that I have the time commitment to go for that just yet. Right. That's what always happens. It's the same kind of thing with Stripe Ruby Mock right now. Like I forked a fork and then fixed something with the, their fork that added some feature that I needed. And I got all the test passing for Pagan last night, but now I'm running my own fork of someone's fork of the official gem that hopefully that fork gets merged in. And then mine can kind of be like, cut out maybe because i also mentioned to that guy on the fork that like hey you need to add this thing too and we'll see but that they they've been like oh we'll merge these things in soon and that was like two weeks ago and all of those prs now are broken or whatever they're like um the conflict with master now so i don't know if that's ever gonna get resolved very quickly or not but yeah it's one of those days. I considered forking it for Podia 
And then, like, the maintenance overhead of it, I was just like, no, like, we can't afford this. So we ended up, I ended up just stubbing a lot of that stuff um, and returning, mm-hmm. like, Stripe, JSON kind of stuff. And I don't know. Eventually, we'll probably, like, we'll have to change up how we test Stripe, but we're getting by. So. Yeah, I was going to say, um, for pay, because there's no equivalent to like Stripe Ruby mock for Braintree. I actually just have it connect to Sandbox and, you know, run real stuff. And that works pretty well. Um, you just record it with VCR and then play those tapes back and it works good. So I was kind of thinking about doing the same thing for Stripe. The only problem is when you're trying to simulate stuff like a card token or you know payment method idea you need that to be like a real one and so then maybe you have to build your own helper thing or whatever that's maybe server side that's like calling the payment id or payment method create or something instead of actually running the javascript and that was kind of the only piece of the puzzle that was like yeah i don't know if i want to go switch all this over just yet if I can get this working again. So it didn't take too long, but it's something I'll probably do in the future too, is just, you know, record those actual API requests to their test environment and call it a day. And then you're, you're stripping out a whole lot of dependencies and other maintenance, Mm -hmm. which is nice. Yeah. We, at my last job, before we switched to Stripe, we were on Braintree and that's how they did all their Braintree testing was just with VCR and, that's what I wanted to do with Stripe at work, but our factories know a little bit too much about Stripe. And so it created like a lot more requests than you would expect. So it just wasn't feasible for the amount of tests we have. So yeah, that's fair enough. But I'm trying to think if there's anything other exciting going on. Um, there's not really. Yeah, I can't think of a whole lot else. you have any uh, conferences or anything you're going to in the future? No, I'm not even going to RubyConf. It's in my home state. Mm, man. We're uh, decided instead of putting money towards going to a conference, we'd go on a little family vacation. So. Oh, nice. Where to? Uh, we're going to Dallas because my oldest son is obsessed with Peppa Pig, the, I guess, <laughs> And they have a Peppa Pig world in Dallas, and that pretty much like is the only reason we're going. <laughs> so hey, there you go. That sounds fun. Yeah, so we're going the week before Ruby Conf, and I don't know. It just seems like the right thing to do. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's fun to go to those conferences, but like you need some time off too, and that's uh, much easier, you know, to to swing rather than you know. Your whole family can't go to RubyConf and enjoy it as much as you do. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is um, now, now that I'm not on Twitter, I won't feel like I'm missing out as much because that's, that's the problem. I don't go to like a RubyConf or a RailsConf is everyone's talking about it and I just have major like fear of missing out. So yeah. yeah. I hear you on that. I definitely like – you know, anytime I see conferences like that, we have one in town called Strange Loop that I haven't gone to for years. But every time I see tweets about it, I'm like, oh, maybe I should go. And it's just not usually very relevant to what I'm doing. So I don't go. But it's it was fun the year or two that I did go and, you know, learn some Erlang and whatever else. But it's not it's it's a lot of stuff that's not something I do day to day. And so, yeah, so when I don't see it, then I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. I didn't miss anything. I can go watch YouTube videos afterwards or something instead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that reminds yeah. me. Um, uh, I need to get to recording my... I'm going to do a guest screencast for Ruby Tapas on uh, on StimulusJS, which should be fun. Uh, nice. Kind of in the in the process of writing the script for that. And uh, now I need to record the audio and the video and get that all done and uh, uh, over to them so they can edit it. So that's pretty exciting. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, are you nervous, excited? How do you feel about it? Oh, uh, it's just kind of like any other day, honestly. Like, I don't do this process for creating a video. Um, so to me, it's kind of weird. Like, I will sit down and try and record something live, more or less, and just like pair program with you, even though you're not there. Um, and so this process of like recording a script and then, you know, outlining all the shots and recording the video and audio separately and whatever things we want to have on screen um, for some of the slides when I'm talking about something. It's kind of interesting um, to get a different perspective. Like this is stuff I was trying to do originally and I haven't done it for years. So it'll be interesting to record some screencasts in this other style and see, you know, uh, I'll be better at it now than I was six years ago when I was starting, but like I haven't done that process for a long time. So I'm curious to see how it'll go. And if, if it helps or are there any things I can pick up to like improve my workflow, that would be fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. I'm excited to watch that. I am a Ruby Tapas subscriber. I'm also a GoRail subscriber. Hey, yeah, we met way back when, when you were going out to Kansas city for RailsConf. Uh, you just emailed me. So here we are. Pretty cool, man. It's exciting. I, uh, I think we've maybe talked. I'm going to do Southeast Ruby again, but I don't know. I think this might be my last year doing it. Mm. I yeah, I know it, it was uh, up in the air last time I remember, but we may have talked between then and I just forgot. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah, I don't know if it will be. I'm not going to like announce it as like the last one yet, but it's it's a lot of work, obviously. Yeah, dude. And I don't know. I also think about changing it out of Nashville this year, but I got oh. I got to talk to Ernie and Shannon before I do any of that. But I don't know. Maybe change it up a little bit, especially if this ends up being the last year. I want it to be like the one I really enjoy. So yeah. So we're all going to Hawaii or something. <laughs> South Uber Southwest Ruby. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. That'll be interesting to hear what you come up with for that. I always love going to that. Those little conferences are some of my favorite. Just going to meet so many people there compared to RailsConf or something. There's you meet a lot of people, but it's all kind of shorter connections with people. Mm -hmm. You see them in the hallway, you say hi, and you keep going. But at like Southeast Ruby, you're going to spend time with them, you know, after – after hours at the bar or whatever, and just chat some more, which I liked. Yeah. Even as an organizer, I feel like I've gotten to know a lot of people just through the conference like that. I wouldn't have met. Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, Fernando gave a talk, uh, an OOP talk at Southeast Ruby. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. in Chicago like three weeks ago. That's where he lives. And like, we got together and hung out and that was oh, cool. cool. Yeah. That's, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's like, this is just a great community of yeah. people. So, yeah, it, we've been, the GoRails Slack's been blowing up lately because uh, we got GoRails into GitHub student, the, the GitHub mm -hmm. student developer pack. Um, so I'm giving any oh, students, definitely. basically, I give any students a uh, full year of GoRails for free if you're part of the pack and you verify that you're a student with GitHub. Then uh, we've had like, I don't know, a thousand students or more sign up in the past two weeks or whatever. Gee. Um, so it's pretty awesome. They, oh, she's, no. <laughs> the lady at GitHub said they have like 400,000 students sign up every year, uh, if I remember right. And they have like 800,000 students um, that have been signed up total or whatever. And yeah, it's huge. So it's kind of cool. And, you know, GitHub's a service that's built on Rails. So it's that nice, you know, thing to, to promote. So they tweeted about it and uh, my Twitter blew up. I was really distracted for, I don't know, like a week because when they tweeted about it, it was just like constant barrage of favorites and retweets and, you know, replies. And I, I just... My phone was, 
you know, new notification every few seconds. It felt like for a while. Well, luckily that's died down, but wh- boy, that was fun. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a ton of new people and love having them in the community and stuff. And hopefully they'll learn a lot. So yeah, it's been good. So we'll see it kind of how that goes in the long run, but it's a cool announcement for sure. Yeah. That rules. Uh, you got a lot of good things going on, Chris. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, too much now. I'm like too distracted because if I'm not working on a screencast then I'm like, you know, trying to help people or getting emails about Hatchbox support and trying to add features to Hatchbox or Jumpstart needs work and then pay needs SCA updates and so does Jumpstart. And then at this point, I might as well upgrade Hatchbox and Go Rails Stripe integrations too. And yeah. We record your course. Yeah, we record my course for SCA. That's kind of the next step, I think, now that I've got it working. Um, so that's going to be something I'll do in the next uh, couple weeks, I think. And then at some point, I need to figure out what my uh, Black Friday sales are going to be for Hatchbox and Jumpstart and Go Rails and all that and get them ready to go before Black Friday. So I am way too busy and I, I don't know. I just can't think straight anymore, it feels like. So i got to take some time and get organized. Mm-hmm. Well, I uh, we'll just call this one a catch-up episode, and we'll get a little more technical next week. Yeah, sounds good. Um, we don't have any more guests scheduled, so maybe we'll do another catch-up and get a few more people in the books. But till then, I will talk to you later, man. Sounds good. We'll see you. See you.